Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the July 6, 2020 uh, meeting of the LNA committee. Um, we will call the meeting to order and begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America. Of America. To the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Jason Marsh. Here. Thomas Whitmore. Here. Ashley Gaudiano. Here. Eric Paulson. Here. Carl Massaro. Here. Stephen Lemoyne. Here. Joy Cologne. Here. Tony Sento. Here. Okay, we have uh, one item on the agenda tonight. Um, just as a reminder for those who are speaking, just announce your name uh, before you speak. Um, Ashley Gaudiano, would you please bring resolution TC28-80 to the floor? Yes, let me pull up the resolution. Uh, resolution TC 28-80 be resolved that the first draft report of charter changes as approved by the Charter Revision Commission 2020 on June 24, 2020 is hereby accepted. Be it further resolved in accordance with Section 7-191 of the Connecticut General Statutes that if the Town Council makes no recommendations for changes in said draft report, the draft report is deemed the final report. Public hearing LNA July 6, 2020. All right, do I have a second? Second, Tom Whitmire. All right, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, the committee chair or the commission chair, uh, Kate Donahue. Uh, I will turn it over to her. I understand she's going to make a presentation about uh, the report and then uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, and thank you to the rest of the committee for allowing us the time to discuss the commission's recommendations. Um, as Jason said, I'm Kate Donahue. I'm the chair of the commission. Uh, our vice chair is Nancy Gardner, and the other commissioners are Tom Tesoro, uh, J.C. Sinelli, Marty McCann, and Susan Gilson. Our, our clerk has been Cindy Katsky, and uh, attorney Shopik has been working with us. Um, as I think you all know, the charter is a living document and should be reviewed periodically to make sure it stays current with state uh, law and governing practices. And the last time the charter was revised was in 2011. So 10 years in or so, it seemed like a good time to take another look at it. Um, this commission has spent the last two and a half months reviewing and discussing changes to the, to the town charter. Um, during the course of our deliberations, we've received over 80 comments or suggestions from almost 35 town citizens. Um, we've held two public hearings and we voted on almost 50 items and present uh, just about 40 of them in this report for you to consider. Um, we will discuss this in whatever detail you'd like, but I'd like to quickly review the three documents that you were sent just so you kind of have a lay of the land. Um, the first is a two page summary of our recommendations and it's called summary of the draft report to the town council. It includes an explanation of the two kinds of changes we made, the first being changes that fix administrative issues, modernize terms, uh, clarify definitions, or bring the charter into alignment with state statute. And the second being more substantial uh, or substantive changes. Um, the summary includes specific reference or examples of nine changes that we've made and our recommendation on how the question should appear on the ballot if the town council so approves. So that's sort of an encapsulated version of the full report. The second uh, uh, document that we sent you is the full draft report to the town council. This one's 25 pages and it's a full list of all our recommended changes. Um, and let me quickly explain the format of the report just so it's easier to understand how we laid it out. They are listed in the order that they appear in the town charter. Um, so the changes are listed by chapter and section, the current charter language, the language we're proposing, our reasoning for the change, and then the date that we voted on the change to the measure. Uh, so that if you wanted to go back and look at our minutes, you could see you know, what the discussion looked like. Um, 
I should note that almost half the recommended changes address two specific issues um, under that sort of administrative clarifying. One is clarifying the, the, the use of days, whether it's business or calendar, um, and then modernizing the posting slash notification process for very, at various aspects of the town government. Um, the final document we sent to you is the red line version of the current 56 page charter, which has all of our changes in it. It's a lot to go through, but we thought that the, the three documents together would provide some sort of a roadmap. Um, as you know, this report is a draft for the town council's consideration. The council may send um, us back to reconsider or look, look at uh, additional items and we will do so, you know, if we get recommendations back from you before we submit our final report. The town council then decides if the revision will go to the voters and if exact, and then exactly how the ballot questions will be, um, will be listed on the, on the ballot in November. Um, so that's the overview of the process. Um, and I think we're ready to take questions. If you, I, again, there's a number of ways we can approach this. I wasn't planning on going through everything uh, one at a time, but if you'd like us to do that, we'd be happy to do that as well. Um, this is Tony Sinto, I have a question. Uh, it's on page 52, section nine of the red line report. Red line report. Mm -hmm. Bonded. Chapter and section? Uh, section nine, bonded debt. And wait, what chapter is it? Uh, chapter, chapter, let's see. Special, special section eight, special uh, referendum requirements, yep. page 50. Yep. That starts it, and then it goes on. It starts on page 52. Yes, sir. So, last few pages. Well, I have um, just uh, just want to know what the thought. Why doesn't this question? Why doesn't? Why didn't you guys um, two things have a? It's I think band of bonded debt should have its own question. You shouldn't lump this in with the potpourri questions. If you're gonna change the bonded debt question, it should be a separate question. Also, um, the CPI thing was something that was brought out the last time and uh, in 2012 or 2011. And the reason why we got rid of it the last time was because it's too hard if people don't know about consumer index and how it works in percentages, it's kind of confusing to the normal person who's not a financial person. So that's why it was just a $15 million debt, a $15 million figure rather than, because if I remember correctly, the last um, Russ Friedson was trying to think of some other type of way of doing it was uh, CPI plus percentages plus all this other stuff. And we, and we kind of decided on just a flat amount to make it a little bit easier. And third thing is, my recommendation would be to lower the $15 million to $10 million. Okay, so those so are the three things that I had. So the first two things are, why does it have its own question? Uh, I think the CPI is not really a question, but uh, CPI is kind of confusing to some people. And was there any thought process in dropping it from 15 to say 10? I think it should be 10. Those are my three questions. On that section. Okay, so who wants to take this one? Uh, Dan, Nancy, or you? You want me to take a crack? I'll do it. You want me to take to this is Dan Shopek. If you want me to, uh, sure, respond. Um, I, I think the the um, proposal is that the town council and the the board of finance and the town council look at that CPI. So I don't think it's that difficult for between the town council and the board of finance to determine what that CPI would be. Uh, we had looked at, I believe that, um, you know, we looked at the increase in CPI from, uh, or increase in the value of the dollar from 2011 when this was adopted to today, I think that 15 million would have been a couple million dollars higher uh, for the same value. So this was, 
basically this was a compromise uh, there in terms of leaving it at the 15 million, but having that be a floor and the possibility of increasing it going forward. Um, the, um, the, I don't, the, I, you know, my own mind, uh, the, the idea of reducing that to 10 million, uh, then basically every time you have a bond, large bond issue, it would have to go to referendum. It would, uh, I, I, I don't find it practical myself, and, but that's a, that's a political decision that people need to make. And the third part of your question, Tony, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, um, why, why doesn't the uh, referendum have its own question? Oh, well, that's, rather, than, rather than lump it in with the, um, with like the, uh, I think I, cosmetic I, changes. The answer would be that the referendum was already there. One, one of the things, the, the, uh, the referendum was there with no, um, uh, with, with no, no description or, or no process of how it was to be implemented. So this really is taking the $15 million figure and creating a, a process uh, so that people know how, it, how they can, um, uh, how you would bring that to, to the voters. So, uh, well, the only reason why I brought it up, um, Dan, was you're, you may be raising the referendum number, so therefore you'd be raising the debt if you were to. I know there's a provision in here that in order to go to the CPI number, you'd have to have uh, 14 votes, or set, is it 14? On the town council and the board of finance, is that that's what it said? Two thirds, yeah. Two thirds of the, of the council. I don't think it required two thirds of the board of finance, but. Uh, okay. I thought I, I thought I read that in here. Board of finance now. and town council. Okay, yeah, both, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I read that in here. Okay, all right. That's I, I just wanted to, want to know. So your recommendation is it's already here. You're just making cosmetic changes to it. Yeah, we had so we actually okay. had no idea if how to if if the fifteen million dollar project came up. Uh, we didn't have any process uh, which we could implement it. So this was an, an effort only just to, to provide an implementation. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Dan, this is Jason Marsh. I've got a quick question on the resolution. Mm -hmm. We read it. It says public hearing July 6th, 2020. Are we, are we having a public hearing this evening? There is a public hearing scheduled for tonight. It has been noticed in the newspaper. Okay. Let me know when I formally need to open the public. Well, you, when you're ready to allow people to uh, to speak, if he, the, the from the public. Okay. Right at this point, you, you can do it. You can start it at any time, Jason. But um, uh, right now, you you haven't asked for uh, uh, the the attendees to participate, so it's, it really is up to you. Okay, um, Kate. It was, you, warned, uh, it was warned for seven o'clock. So anytime okay. after seven o'clock, you can proceed. Okay, thank you, Dan. Are, are there any other questions or comments from the LNA committee for the charter revision members? I, I have some questions. Steve, I do too, Jason. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at chapter two, section 5A. That's actually the first place it appears, but it's actually throughout the, the entire document where it says that um, notification to the newspaper is no longer going to be um, an option. It's going to be strictly the town webpage. Uh, I guess my thought is we're assuming that uh, the entire town of Trumbull is uh, on, has technology, has a computer, has access to the website, uh, and is tech, tech savvy enough to use it. I, I think that's that's a very big assumption, uh, especially when we talk about the more senior people of our population. It's just an observation. Yeah, I would say we debated that one quite a bit, but we, we kept coming back to the, the realization that this is how large majority of people get their information, that the, the um, circulation in Trumbull of various publications, Connecticut Post in particular, continues to drop, to, to decline. Um, in, some of, in some of these um, publishing posting uh, changes we made, we, we added the phrase at a minimum, so you would still be able to publish in the newspaper if the particular body felt that was the right thing to do or appropriate. Um, 
but it's trying to be realistic about where where the technology is going. But, so happy to hear your thoughts about that. Anybody else on the commission want to comment? This is, uh, this is Nancy Gardner. Um, yeah, we did talk about that a lot, and I do think that's why we added the at a minimum, because I do think the town council will, uh, will always have the option to make it a, you know, uh, a requirement that, that you also do it in the paper, especially, you know, if they're running, they're talking to their constituents, their constituents say they get their information from a paper newspaper, as opposed to, I can only tell you, from my street, I get three newspapers, but I am the only one on the street that gets those papers because I'm there in the morning when it's delivered and the new, they drive up, drop in my driveway and then drive away. So I do think that the town council would be able to continue that to um, report in the newspaper if they felt that that was the way people wanted to get their news, but it wouldn't be required by the charter that it be in a paper newspaper. I have some other questions, uh, unless you want to give Okay. Mr. Moy, I think Tom Tesoro was going to add something further to that. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. There was the, this is Tom Tesoro speaking. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the rest of the commission, there's also an ancillary benefit to the taxpayers of about $70,000 per year in reduced cost by not publishing it in the newspaper. We just want to add that as well. That was all. Mr. Lemoyne, yes, I have. I have a few more questions. Well, can I, can we stay on this topic for one second? It's Carl. Yeah. Um, in, in res with respect to this provision and other notice provisions, um, is website notification uh, compliant with state law, Freedom of Information Act? Attorney Shopik? I believe it is. And that's all we have to do. I notice in other aspects, uh, notification is being lowered from 48 days down to 20, excuse me, 48 hours down to 24. Which is, which is what the Freedom of Information Act requires. Right. This is uh, Jason Marsh. I believe that's for, um, for, I'm forgetting the term, but non-substantive uh, materials, correct? I think that's, what it had to do with notice of the meeting where a council specifically was changed to five calendar days from five business days. I think the rest of the days were left as business days for the most part. Um, maybe somebody you know, on the commission could comment on, on why those uh, particular changes. So we're switching over to the days conversation now. Carl, is that? I guess I, I guess so. That's kind of part and parcel of the all the notice provisions that were changed here. They we're trying to become more consistent in the references to days. So, um, with the exception of Chapter Two, with all the legislative the legislative branch days are going to be business days, which are defined as the days that. The, clerk, the weekdays that the clerk, town clerk's office is open. We actually made that adjustment after the, the uh, our public hearing last week. Um, so business days, unless, unless specified as calendar days, and in general, the calendar days, well, we kept calendar days in other parts of the charter were to give people more time to do things that, rather than less. So, um, or, or if we're talking about 30, 60, 90, that seems to make more sense to go calendar days than business days. Is that what you're getting? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I remember when we went through this in 2011, I had encouraged the commission then to study each time the word day is presented in the charter because- Which we did. It had, um, particular impact on, on some bodies like the town council having to go out to five business days was uh, was a challenge. We met the challenge, but um, uh, and it, my general reaction to reducing the days, however, and limiting the type of notification is that it's really a lot less transparent, a lot less fair to the public. They're going to get a lot shorter notice of meetings and information than they used to get under these proposed changes. Uh, 
uh, I'll yield back to Steve. I think he had some other questions. Yes, uh, I have two more questions. Uh, one has to do with chapter five, section three, uh, dealing with the Board of Ed. Um, by going to an eight member board, I'm just curious how tie breakers are determined. We also spent some time talking about that. This is Kate Donahue again. Um, for a significant period of time, the board was six members, um, three and three of each party. Um, and we could not recall uh, very many times that they couldn't come to some resolution. That was the whole point of it being evenly split was that they would have to reach some sort of compromise where someone would have to reach across the aisle and and vote you know, with the other side. So um, with that thinking, if, it, if it's a tie, it doesn't, uh, you know, a matter doesn't, motion doesn't pass. Um, so we don't see that be, as being something that would happen very often. Anybody else want to comment? I'll just make one other comment. This is Dan Shopik again, that the, the uh, state statute provides that uh, if the uh, Board of Education is unable to elect a chair, the town council elects the chair. So um, that would be the only case in which a, if there is a quote unquote tiebreaker. Uh, historically, when the town council, if the town council controlled the um, if one party controlled the town council, uh, the board members historically just voted for the member of the party that controlled the town council. Uh, and I can't remember any time when they actually had to go to the town council for a vote. Mr. Tesoro. And then number eight, I just for the record was recommended by Loretta Chori, who was the outgoing chair of the board of education as well as Laney McHugh, who is the current chair of the Board of Finance. So uh, mem a leading member of each party uh, recommended the number eight, in part because of the amount of work that's required. And the, uh, we were thinking of reducing it to six. They recommended going to eight uh, because of the amount of work that the Board of Education has to put in for things like budgets and the like. Um, this is Tony Sinto. I have a question. Um, when we redid this in 2012, the reason why we went to um, every two year term was that the voters got to vote on the Board of Ed. In this particular instance, the Board of Ed is gonna go back the way it was when it was a six person board where the town committees pick the Board of Ed members and, then, and they automatically, when they go on the ballot, they automatically win. So how is that beneficial to the voters if they can't really vote on the Board of Ed members. And really the town committees are the ones voting on the Board of Ed members. If I could just, this is Dan Shope again, you're, you're not limited. The town committees could actually um, nominate more people than they can take seats. So they, people of their own party would be running against each other and uh, individuals could uh, petition to get on the ballot and, uh, and run against the uh, uh, designated people from the town committee. So, so there is a possibility. I can only think of one instance, and I don't remember who the people were. I can think of one instance several years ago when the Democratic Party did not nominate one extra, one more than they could elect. And there was a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a election between them, uh, but uh, I can't, my recollection, I can't think of any time that the Republican Party did that. Right. So in essence, all the time that I did this, probably from 2000 and say five until we, we changed in 2012, minus the two year seat when it was a seven member board, um, the town committees picked those seats. So most likely, and you're right, Dan, it could be an instance where there's a change and it could happen, but 90, you could say 98% of the time, the town committees are going to pick the board of that with the eight member board. Or a six member board. Yeah. That's or right. six. Correct. Right. Yeah. The Absolutely. other thing we were trying to address was the situation uh, that we, I think we have found ourselves in now where you have on a two year term, 
a number of new people joining the board right before they have to put a budget together, which is extremely difficult. This recommendation would put us on a staggered process to get to you know, only half of the board turning over potentially every, every other year. So there was a number of things we were trying to achieve here, but the main one honestly was to go back to an even number of board members to try to depoliticize the board. Well, in my opinion, you're, you're politicizing it even more doing it this way. Yeah, that's right. That's just my opinion. Just, just, you know, I'm just one person. But like I said, when I got involved in this in 2005, the Board of Ed, it was, they already, you know, they automatically win their seat. It was kind of silly, but okay. I just thought I'd bring it up. Thanks. Mr. Massaro. Thank you. Um, the first question I have is in chapter two, excuse me, chapter seven. No, chapter four, section three. This is adopting the budget duties of the town council. When I, I read subsection, um, where did I go? Uh, subsection B. Uh, in the red line copy you gave us, it reads that the council shall consider the budget recommended by the Board of Finance and shall adopt the budget no later than the second Monday in May and submit the same to the first selectman within two days of adoption. I read that and I, I pulled my copy of the 2011 charter out. And I believe we have an April 30th deadline to adopt a budget in the current charter. Red line. Carl, this is Dan Chopik. Uh, the, council, the council amended the charter last year. So the dates that are in there were, were uh, uh, determined by the town council um, under, by statute that allowed the uh, town council to amend the charter. Okay, but this, well, okay, I'll just give my opinion. I think we need to go back to the April 30th deadline. You have the ability, you have the ability to do that by, um, uh, by the town council, the, that particular legislation has not been changed. So the town council could change the dates for the budget at any time. Well, I, I know we were uh, authorized by state statute to extend it for extenuating circumstances in past budget years. But I mean, those of us who've been around for a long time know that the Board of Ed struggles when they don't know what their new budget number is by April 30th, because they, get, they have a May 1st deadline on their labor uh, to notify them whether they're being retained or not. And I think if you are going to put, or you know, put into the charter, the ordinance that the council passed to the second day of May, you're, you're just going to uh, continue the same difficulty every spring uh, when it's a budget to be adopted. Carl, it wasn't an ordinance. It was an amendment to the charter. Well, whatever it is, I'm, it's my recommendation that we go back to April 30th. Understood. Well, you, however it got there. Understood. Thanks, Carl. I have uh, one more question, if I may. Hey, Mr. Lemoyne. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at Chapter 5, Section 17, subparagraph D. It has to do with um, the Ethics Commission. And specifically, that subparagraph has a lot that's lined out with respect to any person who's charged with the violations. Um, individual rights being taken away. Can somebody explain why? Martin, I can, I can try and weigh in on that, uh, Steve. Okay. <clears throat> the reason that language is crossed out is because all of those provisions that have been crossed out are included in the code of, of ethics. So it was, we thought that it, it, it was those particular rights afforded to a person who is the subject of, of an ethics complaint, um, those rights are better embodied in the code of ethics than they are the charter. 
So okay, so so you were looking at it as a redundancy. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Um, this is Tony Sinto. I have another question. I unfortunately lost my little note tag that I had on here. It was about boards and commissions. I think I read someplace that there was a change where if, um, say, a board or commission person doesn't show up for a certain amount of days without, you know, a, you know, have an excuse or whatever the case is, they automatically get removed from the board. Is that correct? I, I can't find the, my page. I lost my page on that. Now we added something that says the, the appointing authority may remove any member of an appointing commission for failing to participate in at least 50% of the meetings in a fiscal year or for failing to participate in three consecutive meetings. So it's may, it gives the, the appointing authority some, some uh, ability to um, you know, replace someone who, who doesn't have the time or, or you know, for whatever reason can't, can't participate. Cindy, I think I cut you off. I was I just going to point out where, where it's located. This is Cindy Katsky, the clerk of the commission. It's on page 40. It's okay. uh, chapter seven, section, new section 25 D, page 40. Hang on. I know I, I had and I lost it, but okay. I, I just thought it was kind of tough, but I mean, if there's a May in there, it's hard to get volunteers sometimes. So I thought it was kind of tough that you put that in there. Maybe the person's sick or, you know, broke their leg or something. They can't make it. So there's a, the maze in there that would, that would help them out. Correct. Yeah. I yes. mean, okay. Specifically, we said removal is discretionary and not mandatory to account for potential issues such as illness or hardship of a member. So it's, we debated that one too. So you're, you're thinking the same way we were Tony. Well, I watched some of your meetings, so I kind of, then I was just trying to match it up with this, but okay, thanks. And this is Cindy Katsky again. And there, there was um, one situation where a um, border commission member was appointed and just never showed up, did not respond to emails, did not respond to phone calls. And the seat was really wasted that, you know, I think it was a couple of years the person didn't show up and, and without any response whatsoever. So. It's really that sort of situation um, that we were seeking to address. The commission okay. is seeking to address. Thanks. I just uh, thanks for the information. Is it Chair Jason? I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, I'm hoping we can actually go back to the Board of Education for a second. Um, I have two questions. One, I know that you dropped the idea of moving forward with four-year terms for the first selectman and um, town treasurer and town clerk, I believe. Why did you leave this one in as a four-year term? I know there's been some chatter out there on, on social media about why this is a four-year term. Um, the Board of Ed is probably one of the most complex parts of, of our town government and two years simply isn't enough time to totally understand what's going on. So we felt the four year term made a lot more sense um, as it has historically been. Um, only since the last change did we, did it go down to two. So um, it's a giant part of the town budget. Like I said, it's a very complex system and uh, for the Board of Ed members to be fully effective that longer term makes a, a ton more sense in our opinion. Anybody else want to weigh in? Mr. Shortley? Yeah, if I could, it just, and you can see it's, it has been um, uh, the, uh, in terms of the membership, it's, it's staggered so that in the first election, you, it'd be not more than two Republicans for the f two year seat, not more than f two Republicans for the four year seat, and the same, not more than two Democrats and not each, so that right. the, the makeup, the political makeup uh, is going to be, we'll, we'll have the same carryover of uh, four members uh, staying on for each, uh, each time. That makes sense. And then just to uh, um, Tony's point earlier, you know, I, I do have concerns about the fact that we end up with uh essentially town committees putting forward members who then end up elected how many people dan would they be able would any party run right if we've got 
maximum it, maximum of people can be elected. So you can run more than you can run more than you can see. You can run one more than you can see. No, you is that what it would be? As many as many as can be elected. I think okay. we made reference to a, to a particular statute, which was the same statute that uh, applied in the 1981. 19, I think, yeah, 1980. That 9-204 yeah, statute? Yeah, that, it allows you to, to nominate as many people as can be elected to the, to the seat, not as many people as your party can elect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is Tony. I got another question. Uh, Sinto. Uh, just, a, just a, this, I guess this is a housekeeping one, maybe. Uh, Section 10A, um, Section 10, 50, uh, page 54. Uh, it was struck out a deputy register of voters may be appointed as provided in general statutes. What was the thing? What, why did you guys uh, strike that line out? Because the deputies aren't voted on, who, who puts them in that position? Uh, Dan, you want to take that? I think the, the uh, registrar appoints the deputy, and that's what the statute says, so it seemed redundant. Um, okay. The only reason. Also, uh -oh, just... this this is Cindy Katsky. I think the um, uh, the former registrar who spoke to us said that the statute provides that a deputy registrar must be appointed, and then assistant registrars may be appointed. And the commission just felt that by referencing state law, that we didn't need to rehash what the state law said because what we had was not not uh, consistent with state law. Okay, I'm just checking. Thanks. Mr. Massaro, you had your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple of points. Uh, if I could just go back to the Board of Ed for a second. The two-year terms with seven members that was adopted in 2011 or actually phased in, in two, with the 2011 um, charter change was to put the membership of the Board of Ed on, on the same terms as the Town Council. The Town Council at the time was the only body that had a two-year term. Um, and so the thinking of, of the Council in that session was that the Board of Ed should have seven members um, so there could be no ties or theoretically be no ties. There can always be a tie if somebody's absent or if somebody abstains. Um, but the idea was to give the voters the fresh look at the Board of Ed every two years. And they would actually choose amongst the candidates that were nominated uh, as to who they wanted, regardless of uh, party. And uh, I know I don't want to repeat everything that's been said tonight, but the, you know we're going back to the old way, uh, which is four year term, staggered. I like the idea of staggering actually um, but the parties are going to basically appoint people to the board, and the vote is nominal. Uh, this is Jason Marsh. Um, just in response, uh, Mr. Massaro, I, I too like the idea of staggering in this, you know, the, the notion of uh, a board of new, uh, a completely new people coming in and having to do a budget is, is um, a daunting task and, and frankly could lead to, to problems. With respect to the four-year um, sort of the equal number of, of members and, and the, the fact that committees get to appoint, is there a compromise, and I'm putting this out to the group, of, you know, to, as Ashley was saying, uh, requiring the parties to put up a certain number of candidates so there has to be a choice for the voters, and it's not just, you know, this is our slate, they get elected. Um, is, that some, is there a middle ground to be reached on that point? I'm asking the, the commission. And I don't know, what's the... Yeah, I don't think you can force anybody to make a nomination. It's a political political process under the election law. Um, the, as I said, you, you, you can nominate more people than uh, can, than can be elected. So that gives you the, the opportunity. And if, if there are other people who want to uh, petition to get on the ballot, they do have the opportunity to petition as ad additional people to get on the ballot. So it's, it's open. And one of the things also, this, this particular question, the, the 
um, the commission has recommended that this be put on as a separate uh, question uh, to to the voters. So that that one could be up or down as, as far as uh, at the November election. That's a great point. Thank you for that reminder that that's a separate question. This is Kate Donahue again, though, Dan Kidd, but I think the question really is, can we put in the charter that there has to be more candidates than there are? I mean, is that, is that something the commission could recommend? I don't think so, because I think it's, it, is, um, uh, it is controlled by state law. It's an elected office. It's controlled by state law. If this were appointed offices, yes, you could, uh, you could do that. This is Jason, again, Jason Marsh. Um, you know, I, I, I do have some uneasiness with the, the way this is, you know, the optics of how that's playing out in terms of who gets nominated uh, and, and ultimately elected. Um, and did the commission give any thought as to how to encourage um, either unaffiliated uh, people to run for the, uh, the Board of Ed or, uh, you know, people who aren't a member of a political party. I mean, it's, it, yes, you can petition on to the, to, to the, the, uh, the, the ballot, but um, that is a more daunting process than otherwise is the case with the two-party system. Kate Donahue, no, we did not talk about that specifically, but, but I will say that, you know, I, uh, it's probably Carl that said, you know, we're going back. That was definitely our intention. Um, having lived in this town for 25 years, half of it, it with an even number of board members and, uh, you know, I'll go on record saying my mother was one of them for 12 years. Um, the board operated, I think, more fairly and was more in the interest of, of um, there wasn't as much partisanship. They had to come to a resolution on situations and I think that that is going to be the best way for us to achieve this. So this is one that I feel very, very strongly about. Are there any other members of the LNA? Uh, just from sorry, I see your hand raised. Um, I I want to acknowledge that the, the uh, world of the Board of Ed is very complex, and I think no matter what the makeup majority Democrat, majority Republican. I think they've done uh, really great work for the town. The other comment I want to make is um, that if you think the Board of Ed's job is difficult and complex, um, the town council's job is at least as difficult. Uh, we have to adopt the budget. We have to do pass on bonding. We have to pass all kinds of legislation. We only get a two year term. We have to face the electorate every two years. And it's part of the logic from 2011 uh, that created the change on the Board of Ed. If I may um, change topics, there's a couple things. Um, in chapter seven, I think it is the board, the one that deals with the Board of Finance and the appointment of alternates. It states the recommendation is to say that one alternate must be a Democrat, one must be a Republican. I don't think I've ever read anything uh, that outward. I would suggest you change the language. There are other parties, there are unaffiliated. And I know there's three alternates, uh, but I don't really think the charter should be directing that one party and another party in an alternate position. Maybe you can explain why that showed up in that fashion. Excuse me, this is Cindy Katsky. I just first wanted to say this is on page 27 of the red line charter. I did receive a, a, a text from someone uh, who's watching who said that page numbers would be most helpful for people who are trying to follow along. So um, I think that's a, that's a great suggestion. So this is page, it is page 27. 27, chapter seven, section one A. So this is Kate Donahue again. Um, Carl, we did spend some time talking about this one. Um, 
initially we had no more than two, th three alternates, no more than two from one party. But then we started talking about, okay, well, what about third party candidates? How can we still give, you know, provide room for them to participate? So that's why we ended up with this specific language was to still re leave room for that possibility. Anybody else from the commission wanna chime in on that? And it is, you're right, the only time I think that we called out specific parties, but, but that, was that was why, was to try to leave room for a third party or independent. I understand that. I just don't think it's right to name parties in the charter. If there's another way, another language uh, format you can figure out that would accomplish what you want to do. Just my, my view. This is Cindy Jordan. Katsky. There, there, there was a, some discussion about major parties, but we felt, I think the commission felt that that was more complicated than it needed to be. So there, so there was, there was definitely discussion about that. Mr. Cesaro, you had your hand raised uh, in response. Did you? Yeah, the comp the uh, the uh, concept here was not Republican and Democrat, but fundamental fairness to people who are elected on um, uh, on these boards that they would have a member of their own party uh, as an alternate should they not be able to attend. Uh, I think there may have been some instances in the past where um, that was not the case, and it created some unfairness toward the minority party, uh, and we wanted to be sure that the minority party, no matter what party that was, would have someone to stand in their place who uh, was from the same political uh, political party. And typically there is a, and at least the way it's currently written, uh, the way the current, the current election is, it's usually a Democrat or Republican who's elected. Sometimes they're unaffiliated voters, but they run on a Democrat or a uh, Democratic or a Republican ticket. So the concept was not to try to limit it, but to be fair to a minority party. That was the concept. I guess my difficulty is, you know, you've got other parties, Conservative Party, Libertarian Party, Green Party. Who knows what the future holds with other kinds of parties. And I think if you spell out an office that is for a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or a Green Party person, you, you that provision could come into legal question. So I'm just thinking there should be a more generic way of approaching it. Food for thought. Are there any other questions or comments from- I do, I do have one more. Um, sorry, Mr. Massaro, Ashley Gaudiano had her hand- That's fine. Go ahead. go ahead, Carl, go ahead. You finish and then I'll ask. Okay. I'm going to page three, uh, chapter two in the legislative branch. And um, section two, composition and election. Um, proposed change calls for seven voting districts with three council members from each district. Um, I obviously know where that's coming from, but I'm gonna ask uh, the town attorney for a written legal opinion on how um, the charter can set up the number of districts, but leave it to the council per state statute to draw boundary lines. I believe the state statutes gives the legislative body, gives the town council the sole jurisdiction over municipal voting districts. It does. That's what you, there's a process right now with a, uh, uh, a uh, redistricting committee, all right? The redistricting committee has, you know, in, in history, I guess, has gone from four districts to five districts to seven districts to four districts. Um, and and the, the, num the number of districts doesn't concern me. It's how the districts, the number of districts and how they're formed uh, is what I'm concerned about. I read the statute that that's the sole province of the town council to do. Well, it's the sole, sole province of the town council to, to define the districts, but it doesn't say it's the sole province of the town council to, decide, to determine how many districts there are. 
it doesn't the statute doesn't differentiate between number of districts or boundary lines of the, of the number of districts. It just says the legislative body is the authority to set municipal districts, period. Well, that also is gonna be put on as a separate, uh, uh, separate question or is recommended to put that on as a separate question. So you can deal with it that way. Well, can, before it gets to the people, we need to present something that is legally sound to the people to vote on. And so I'm asking for a written legal opinion on how the charter can set the number of districts, but the statute says legislative body sets the districts. If I get a request from the chair of the council, I'll prepare it. Okay. So um, last. So this is Tom. This is Tony. I have one more question. Um, Sinto. Mr. Sinto, uh, Ashley was uh, next. Oh, go right ahead. I'll wait. No worries. Mine is very simple. Um, in section, and I don't have the page number, I'm sorry, section chapter seven in the youth section, it says two non voting youth members. Do we want to define? I'm assuming that's under 18 is what we're going for there. And if so, do we want to define that within the age? And if that's not what you were intending, then. I apologize. That's page 39. Thank you, Cindy. This is Kate uh, Donahue. I recall us discussing this. Uh, Tom, do you have a memory of? <laughs> I don't have much memory Nancy left. Does. I... Nancy does. OK. <laughs> Nancy Gardner, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yes, I was having a problem unmuting. Um, we had talked about the original idea uh, that we had thought about was to have the um, principal of the high school um, nominate two people for that board. But then we talked about the fact that there are many high schools in town. So the intent was, in fact, for them to be probably high school students. So I would say, you know, we could define them as being high school students, although they could be younger. But that was the intention was that they would probably be high school students and that, um, that the, they could be nominated from any school. Okay. So we can, we can talk about, you know. Yeah, maybe it's worth putting some sort of range of 13 to 18 or 13 to 17, 14 to 17, something like that. So we have some parameters around what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mr. Sinto? Uh, yeah, this is, thank you. This is Tony Sinto um, on, page 30, section eight, the police commission. Can you um, just review the changes, uh, what you guys are changing on there? Um, in the past, the first selectman appointed them, and now we're saying that the town council is gonna approve the first selectman's picks. Is that a, at something new, correct? Well, it's, uh, maybe uh, this is Dan Shopik again. A statute has uh, provided for this for years. Nobody ever picked up on it. Um, and it also uh, provides that the commission should be either three, three, five, or seven members. Um, and so we've changed the number. Right now we have six members. Uh, so the, uh, and then in order to have the terms turn over in a logical fashion, that's why the, the length of the terms. But, uh, so you're, Dan, you're saying that all these years, all these years, that's what nobody nobody picked up on that. The first selectman picks the police commission. They're supposed to be approved by the town council, but we never did that. Correct. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> how long does that go back? As long as I can remember, Tony. Uh, the, that's a big uh, one, Dan. That's a biggie. And it's it is that's a, a real big one. <laughs> as I say, we have a six member uh, board of police commissioners. And the uh, statute says it should be three, five, or seven. So what will happen is that this year we would drop one member, and um, we have basically determined that there's not going to be a big political fight because one of the members whose terms is up this year has uh, indicated uh, that she doesn't want to be reappointed anyway. So uh, that would um, lead us forward without having to. Uh, interrupt anybody's term of office. Should you put the state statue in there? Pardon? 
is that should you put the state statute in that in that um, in that in that paragraph or no? I don't think it's necessary. It oh, you just okay. Statute. All right, no, I just ask you. That's all. In case somebody was looking for it or whatever. Okay, thanks. I just when I saw that I was like, whoa! Never even knew yeah. that. Thanks, Dan. Somebody pointed it out to me. I didn't find it on my own. I must admit. <laughs> okay. Let's see you waving your hand. Yeah, it's me again. It's Carl Massaro again. Um, I want to go back to page five. This is chapter two, legislative branch. Um, I, I note the addition of um, an exception to the 15 day uh, publication of our legislative actions uh, where, for the appointments to boards, commissions, and committees. It's something I've advocated for 10 years. I'm glad to see it's in here. Um, however, my, I have the question I have, uh, such appointments shall become effective immediately upon posting on the town website. So I just want to review how much time passes between the end of our meeting where we make appointments and it gets posted to the town website because there is the veto power um, of the first selectman that has a certain number of days to act. I think it's two. Uh, so I would just suggest to come up with some language you know, subject to the um, exercise of a veto in the first selectman in chapter three, I think it is. Well, it's not going to be posted. This is Dan show, but it's not going to be posted until it's it's finalized. So the first, it goes through the first selectman first before it can be posted on the. Uh, I mean, it can be posted as part of minutes, but the actual okay. appointment is, is not. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's 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 good. I just didn't know what it meant by posting on the town website. A lot of things get posted. Our actions would be posted before the first selectman's time frame. That's my point. And if, and if the first selectman vetoes, then it comes back for a veto override. It still is, uh, that still pertains. Okay, I just, just clarification, that, that's all. Um, Are there any other questions or comments? Just one more. Oh, just, I got I'm one sorry, more just, too, but go ahead, Carl. Go ahead. Um, I wanna go to chapter three and uh, that is, let me find the branch, that's the uh, executive branch and I'm going to page, starts at the bottom of seven and goes through page eight on to nine. There's a, a substantial rewrite on a temporary absence of the first selectman and who serves and how they get appointed in a vacancy, how it's defined. Can you just take us through what the changes are in these sections? Uh, this is you, want so much. Go ahead, you want to go? Go ahead, Kate. So go ahead. So I was just going to say, these are not so much changes, Carl, as they were clarifications of the system that was already in place. And we weren't, it, it seemed to us that the language that existed in the Charter of 2011 was unclear and subject to fairly wide interpretation. Um, what we did here was basically lay out better, clear time frames clear circumstances under which, at least in our opinion, clear circumstances in which a first selectman uh, needs to or should appoint uh, or the, uh, the, um, someone to, to serve in their place if they can't, uh, and the order in which those appointments should be made. So that was really all it was, Carl. And typically, it was, uh, it was just too, too broad-based, and we thought this language clarified it, made it clearer, and gave specific instances in which it should be done. This is Kate Donahue, just to, clarify, was, Carl, sorry, Kate. just to clarify a little further, if you look at the original language, so we're in chapter three, section three, absence, disability, a vacancy. The original language was in the event of his or her disability, personal emergency, or temporary absence, the first selectman may, by letter filed with the town clerk, appoint the town treasurer or the chairman of the town council. Um, that was the first thing we wanted to clarify was what who goes first, who goes second, um, and then all of the cascading activities after that. So you took away the choice of the first selectman on who to designate. You have to go to the treasurer first on a temporary absence. 
And then if they can't serve or won't serve, goes to the town uh, council, the chair of the uh, town council to next. And then if they won't serve, then it goes to somebody, uh, and commission correct me if I'm wrong, somebody that the town council appoints. Okay. All right, Mr. thank you. Mr. Sinto, you had another question? No, uh, that was, I was gonna ask you guys to review that, but Carl brought it up already, it's okay. Okay, um, any questions uh, further from LNA? Okay. If not, I, even though I guess we're, we're technically open, I will uh, invite those in attendance or those who may be on the phone to uh, participate in the public hearing. I'm not sure how we do this on this in this format. This is Bill Chin. Um, anybody who's on the Zoom may click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, and if you are called in on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I don't see anyone on the phone in the list of attendees. I see seven people in the seven participants in the queue. So, if anyone who is on the Zoom uh, in the meeting would like to ask a question or raise a point, uh, now is the time to do so. Oh, I see a couple hands raised. Um, how do we, so Keith Klein is uh, in the- I'll bring Keith in. Yeah, why don't we do that? Keith, you're muted. There, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, in general, I think the majority of these recommendations uh, seem to be a solution looking for a problem um, with the intent, it seems, of speeding up government, uh, limiting communication, and some anti-democratic shielding of elected officials from transparency through regular elections. Um, outside of a few politically collect connected constituents, I haven't really seen any demand from the public for these recommendations, and as well, Having viewed the minutes and watched most of the meetings, in my opinion, the validity of the origins for these recommendations weren't really debated uh, to a, a complete extent by the committee and just kind of accepted as required by the first selectman's office. Um, to start, the four-year terms for Board of Education members, I think, are a very bad idea as they further shield the board from the residents and as we've seen this year when the same names are run again and again by the local parties there really are no continuity issues that the committee is concerned about but we've seen with boards that have kind of limited accountability there's little room for dissent or change and frankly that role is no less complicated than the town council or first selectman's office which the committee reversed their recommendations on and kept it to terms. Um, longer terms would just make it even harder to hold elected officials accountable to the public and be responsive to the changing needs of our schools. Also, I believe removing the multiple requirements for posting notices in the local newspapers removes a layer of transparency and ironically, uh, the kind of unnecessary attempt at modernization harms the senior citizen constituents that we're trying to serve through the Commission on Aging. Um, and I couldn't find the internet connection numbers for Trumbull to support the argument, but um, the option of only posting notices electronically is very often uh, discriminatory in nature by disenfranchising uh, folks with poor or no internet services from the public. Um, finally, I haven't seen any public outcry or services being lost through the elimination of the Youth Commission and the Charter Revision Committee presented really no reason to add it back. So seeing as how we've done without it for nine years, without anyone noticing it was gone, uh, I don't believe we should add more commissions without a good reason or valid purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klain. Um, Ms. Uh, Bornstein is uh, had raised her hand. Yeah, I just you have a yourself while uh, Ms. Oh. Bornstein is speaking. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you. Um, I just had a question on the Board of Ed terms. It looked to me, I had thought that we were going to staggered terms, um, but it does appear that the terms would all um, be on the same time frame following the 2023 election. Um, if I'm wrong, that's, that's fine. I just wanted clarification on that. Dan, do you want to explain how we, we ran the dates so that we'd start they are, out? The they first. are staggered. Yeah, they are staggered. In other words, four turnover every two years. Okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, is there anyone else uh, in attendance or on the phone that has uh, would like to comment during the uh, open public hearing? Again, please indicate by clicking the raise your hand button or uh, I don't see anyone on the phone, so we don't need to go into that. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing anyone raising their hands. Uh, we'll give another minute or two, but then we will close the public hearing. All right, going once, going twice. Okay, I'm going to officially close the public hearing at 8.08 .08 p.m. Um, and with that, I will ask again on the uh, LNA committee members if there's anything further they would like to discuss or uh, comment on. All right, I'm seeing none. Um, so I'm assuming we are coming to the end of uh, our discussion on this, and I would then call for a vote on resolution TC 28-80. And Madam Clerk, would you do a roll call vote, please? Jason Marsh? Yes. Thomas Whitmore? Tom, you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Ashley Gaudiano? Yes. Eric Paulson? Yes. Carl Massaro. I'm sorry, I could not hear you, Carl. You're muted. <laughs> Carl, you're still muted. Sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't find the screen. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to vote no for now. Thank you. Steve Lemoyne. No. Motion carries four to two. Okay, um, we have no further business on the agenda tonight, so I would then uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. All right, Mr. Whitmoyer, seconded by Ms. Gaudiano. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great evening, everybody. <laughs>